Thank you, Tony, and uh, it's a real pleasure. It's actually not so um, common to interact with uh, student groups. It's, I mean, I may have the opportunity two or three times a year, but it's always a pleasure. And um, I'm always trying to think the angle that I should be presenting the report uh, to make it relevant for you. I'm, I'm aware that I will probably be using a different language. Um, so, uh, do bring me back to order if I if I diverge. Um, maybe maybe you could remind me a little bit uh, how much time I should I should devote to my presentation. Yeah, forty five minutes uh, would be perfect, and then there will be questions, comments, and some students prepared. A specific... Yes, the the, the the discussion of the papers that I shared. Great. So um, um, let me share my screen. It's also quite unusual for me to speak for 45 minutes because the, the audiences that we tend to address um, usually can only uh, put up with 10 or 15 minutes. So um, do interrupt me at any stage if you want me to, to clarify. But um, I will start by saying a few things about the report so that you understand a little bit the angle from which um, I will be coming to this. Um, the report exists since 2002. Um, it is the product of an era that was quite different to the uh, times we're living today. Um, the international community had essentially let down the world's poorest countries uh, in the 1980s and in the 1990s. Um, a lot of uh, structural adjustment programs meant that uh, education and other social sectors had really been penalized um, and budgets in those countries had been cut and as a result there was regression in uh, education progress and other social indicators uh, at those uh, years. Um, in 1990, some of you may know, uh, there was the Education for All program that was uh, introduced through the first joint action essentially between the international organizations and the world's countries. Uh, in Jom Tien in Thailand. But throughout the 1990s, the, the legacy of the policies that were introduced in a, you know, during the financial crisis of the early 1980s and what followed um, persisted. And therefore, there was not much progress. So there was a big, big interest in the 1990s for this to be corrected. And essentially, that is what ultimately led to the Millennium Development Goals in 2000, which included one on education, and that was about universal primary education. Uh, UNESCO was uh, in charge of the Education for All program, which was a wider agenda for education, which moved in parallel uh, between 2000 and 2015, um, uh, in parallel to the MDG. So it was an agenda that was quite broad, not encompassing everything as happened later, but still uh, broad enough. Um, and in Dakar, uh, at the World Education Forum in 2000, UNESCO was entrusted and requested to be responsible for, among other things, not just leading the agenda, but also for monitoring the, uh, this agenda. And the uh, Education for All Global Monitoring Report was born uh, a year later when UNESCO produced the first report, but it was not the uh, kind of report that the world felt it needed at that time, especially the donor community that was interested and was also under pressure from civil society to make visible progress uh, on the commitments that were made uh, in 2000. So uh, when the first reports that UNESCO produced came out, uh, there was a, some uh, backlash. Uh, UNESCO is an intergovernmental organization. What it can say uh, as messages is always quite timid. Um, and therefore, a group of like-minded donors um, proposed and succeeded in requesting that there would be a new report that would be editorially independent and would follow progress on uh, education uh, in the international agenda of the time, which was the Education for All and the Millennium Development Goals. So that's how the, the report came to be established. So we are a report that is hosted by UNESCO, published by UNESCO, but independent. With it. Essentially, we are a report to UNESCO and through UNESCO for the rest of the world. And this was an unusual experiment, as you can imagine. 
uh, especially for UNESCO that is you know, having to deal with uh, individual governments that uh, always contest uh, findings in the report. And in, in, in the end, the report is only successful if you get a few angry letters from countries uh, every year to complain about its content. Uh, but in uh, 2015, there was a common and shared uh, conclusion that it had been a successful experiment. So what happened in the World Education Forum at the beginning of the new development agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development, was a commitment and agreement by all countries for this experiment to continue, no longer as, a, as an experiment anymore, to 2030. So we have a, a mandate uh, since um, uh, that year to do two things. First, to monitor education progress in the sustainable development goals. So every report which appears, it gets published between 15 and 18 months, uh, has um, um, a monitoring part that goes target by target. There are 10 targets in uh, sustainable development goal four from, um, from early childhood to adult education covering multiple uh, types of intervention. Um, but uh, including also the effect of, uh, we cover the effect of education on other goals. And uh, we have always a substantive chapter on education financing. And the second mandate is to monitor the uh, implementation of national and international strategies to achieve SDG 4, with explicit request to hold all partners to account uh, for the extent to which they fulfill their commitments. So that puts the report somewhere in the middle between being a research-based document and an advocacy document. And that's a very fine line that we always try to, uh, to, uh, to tread on. And you see, I have put here the, 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 the themes of the last four reports. We have an advisory board uh, that is uh, internationally representative with multiple constituencies. Uh, they're advising us, they're not really deciding on our behalf, but there's one decision they take and that is the theme of the report. So the themes of the last uh, four issues have been the effects or the interrelationship between education and the other development goals in 2016, accountability in education in 2017-18, migration and displacement in 2019, and inclusion in 2020. And as you see from the, the pictures, essentially uh, we're doing a lot more than just publishing a big report every 15 to 18 months. We also make a summary available uh, in 30 languages on top of the UN languages that the global report is available. We have for every uh, report a youth edition uh, where we kind of try to make some of the messages um, more broadly appealing for a, a broader audience. Uh, gender edition uh, has existed now for eight years. And we introduced last year also a regional edition, uh, which I'm going to say a few things later. We're also starting a new regional report on Africa that will focus on a very particular aspect, which is universal basic education completion and foundational learning. That is a process that is just now beginning. Uh, that will be the first attempt we're making to have more country specific content uh, because the report inevitably has a global uh, outreach. And then with the regional edition, we're trying to have now much more in-depth coverage of regions one or two at uh, each report cycle. But this Africa um, publication will be the first to have a country-specific focus. We have a series of policy papers, four to five a year. I'm going to refer to one in my presentation, but I'm going to refer mostly to three of the online resources that we have that uh, I think you, you may well find useful in your uh, research, uh, as uh, Tony mentioned earlier. Uh, we have a blog in English and Spanish, and we contribute to SDG4 uh, debates. Uh, I think that was mentioned also in my uh, in the short introduction that can be quite uh, important, but less visible in some ways. Uh, I have put also some images to show that uh, our publications are available in several languages. And a reminder that we have two themes forthcoming. Uh, our report for 2021-22 is focusing on uh, non-state actors in education and uh, scheduled for October. And we also have a theme for the 2023 report, which will be technology. But let's come to the, after this introduction, let me come to uh, the main theme of this presentation. Um, there was a very particular reason why our advisory board selected the theme of inclusion. And that is that inclusive education is 
enshrined in the formulation of uh, the SDG4 itself. However, the history of inclusive education has been traditionally associated with the efforts of the community that has been supporting the rights of persons with disabilities, that it's thanks to them, um, starting at least going back to uh, uh, the Salamanca Declaration 1994, um, but really enshrined in the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2006, whose Article 24 has uh, the, uh, the rights to inclusive education uh, explicitly mentioned. However, what happened afterwards was a realization that the mechanisms, the very mechanism that excludes one group, in this case, um, children and young people with disabilities from education, do not really substantively differ from the way other groups are excluded. And that led to um, an intensive consultation period to interpret Article 24, which led to the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities just in 2016 to issue its general comment four uh, that essentially elaborated on, on this interpretation and that broadened the scope uh, of inclusive education. And this is where the report essentially comes. These developments uh, may well have been recognized in academic circles for quite some time, but broadly speaking, for many policymakers around the world, these were not as clear and as well known. For many policymakers, Inclusive education is just about setting an inclusive education department with one person uh, and looking after uh, a few special schools um, around the country. It has not really become uh, embedded that inclusive education is really about quality education. It's, it's a process that should um, ensure that uh, all students belong to the education community, to the school community. Uh, all students are cared for. Um, nobody's potential is considered fixed. Everyone is treated in a way that uh, they can fulfill their po potential through education. This is a, a powerful message um, which affects any country in the world. Uh, uh, unlike what people might think, in fact, every country faces distinct um, inclusion challenges and uh, many countries have uh, essentially the skeletons in the cupboard, as they say, um, and they need to confront these issues uh, directly. So the, the main purpose of this report was precisely to try to popularize uh, this approach to inclusive education, which may have been uh, common among some academics, not all, of course, uh, but definitely is not uh, to this date widely understood. And in that sense, Essentially, what the report says is that identity, background, and ability still dictate education opportunities in so many different ways. The report, uh, if you open um, any edition, you see, of course, that it's packed with statistical information from all over the world. But precisely the, the way we presented uh, these findings was to make it clear that inclusion is really about everyone. Some of the um, interesting statistics that show the extent of exclusion of different groups include the following. First of all, we had a graph where we're showing that at least 20 countries, and those were countries with data, and some of the world's poorest countries that do not have um, such information. No, the single poor rural young, young woman had completed secondary school. Not a single, when in fact by 2030, target 4.1 commits all countries to ensure that everyone completes secondary education. And uh, in those countries, and of course in many more, it may not be zero, but might be five or 10 or 15% um, of young uh, women complete secondary school. 10 year olds in middle and high income countries who are not learning in their home language are 34% less likely to have basic reading skills. This is of course the challenge of including um, ethnic and linguistic minorities all over the world. Refugees are three times more likely to be out of secondary school, despite some progress that we documented in our last report uh, to include uh, refugees in national education systems. Still, they are one of the uh, really most um, 
excluded groups uh, globally, especially at uh, uh, secondary school age. In the United States, as one of several examples, but uh, not many countries actually monitor such uh, instances uh, widely, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex students are three times more likely to stay at home because they feel unsafe, more likely than their peers. But children with disabilities are indeed those who are sometimes facing the most extreme exclusion. And there is no more extreme exclusion than the fact that there are still about um, uh, 15 million uh, children around the world who never ever set their foot in school. And among them, children with disabilities are two and a half times more likely to never go to school than their peers. I'm going to refer a bit more on, um, on that in a minute about disability statistics. So the key message of the report is that countries need to widen the understanding of inclusive education and make sure that they include everyone regardless of uh, their identity, background, or ability. The report uh, reviewed definitions of inclusive education around the world and found that uh, two in three countries had such a definition. But of those, only 57%, so essentially only one in three countries had definitions that when they talk about inclusive education, they cover multiple marginalized groups and not just children with disabilities, or uh, with special education needs. And of course, that in itself is only the first step uh, because if we conceive inclusion as quality education that is really about all children, even the fact of listing marginalized groups or potentially marginalized groups in itself can be problematic uh, in the sense that uh, policymakers should respond to needs of every student and adjust their systems accordingly and not uh, follow a group by group approach, uh, considering that children who are often disadvantaged, they don't have one characteristic, they have multiple intersecting characteristics and therefore going a step at a time, they not address the multiple challenges that they're facing. Uh, there are some logos of organizations listed below. These are just um, organizations that subscribed to, uh, to this concept. And that's important in the sense that um, even groups that are, have been associated with their work on disability are actually very much welcoming uh, this idea to see inclusion in a broad sense and not just in a group specific sense. Data is of course a, a key aspect of um, the progress towards inclusion. Um, how, uh, what data we collect and how we collect such data is really uh, a very strong sign of how countries approach inclusion. Unfortunately, all around the world, there are attempts that end up labeling students and therefore stigmatizing them. And it's very important to remember that no learner should be harmed in data collection. Essentially, um, one way of looking at that uh, is to think of two levels. At the population level, if we want uh, governments to be energized to draw their attention to where the spotlight is actually pointing, away from where it's pointing, but to look at all uh, groups, you need information uh, that have somehow tried to characterize groups uh, and make sure that they're aware where the challenges lie in general. But when we look at interventions at the school level, individual labels can be very harmful. So it's very, very uh, important to be sensitive uh, in distinguishing between these two levels. Inclusion related data should cover all learners and therefore also all uh, stages uh, in the education system from the input level, like what resources are, are being allocated to uh, the processes in the classroom, to outputs like enrollment, making sure that children complete school, but also to outcomes, uh, what they learn. And that type of data should not be used just for resource allocation purposes. Countries should be monitoring a wide range of outcomes, including student experiences. Um, the uh, 
there are very few countries. In fact, uh, the report only mentions the example of New Zealand, where an education management information system collects information on whether students feel cared for, whether they make friends at school, whether they are uh, having positive relationships, uh, whether they send the sense that they belong. Um, interestingly enough, uh, cross-national assessments like PISA have been collecting such information directly from 15-year-old students. Uh, and from that, we see quite an interesting range of uh, responses from different countries of how students uh, uh, feel. Um, on average, about two in 10 feel like outsiders in school. That's a very large number. Uh, but also there are interesting uh, differences between countries and within countries. Disadvantaged students tend to be more likely to feel uh, like outsiders in school. And this is, contains a very important message. But monitoring when it does happen at the school level should be very uh, inclusive in method as well. It's not just about the intention, but also how you collect information, who you ask, who you involve. So that's about the school level. But um, talking about population level, there are all sorts of difficult questions. Um, population censuses and um, household surveys are really key to help us um, access such information. They have been uh, really instrumental in many ways to understand the extent of inclusion uh, and, and, and inequality I'm, I'm going to mention later. Um, but they also come with their problems. Uh, some of these problems are related to the very sensitive nature of questions that are related to language, ethnicity, sexual orientation, um, uh, that have you know, really been um, problematic in, in many countries. Uh, respondents may feel they are likely to be persecuted if they actually reveal uh, such information. And a particular aspect that has been quite challenging has been questions regarding disability. Um, again, there's been a very long process I'm not going to refer to, but in recent years, uh, the Washington Group, one of the groups set up by the UN Statistical Commission, has made progress in um, uh, trying to summarize a set of questions that could be asked uh, globally uh, to have a, a better comparable uh, view of, um, of uh, people who face um, 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 challenging conditions in their lives in ways that are actually not medical, uh, medically defined, but are in line with the social model. Therefore, they don't just recognize the individual's circumstances, but also the conditions on the environment that surrounds them. Uh, these questions have been adapted to, um, by uh, UNICEF for a child functioning module on disability that has been introduced in the latest round of uh, UNICEF's uh, multiple indicator cluster survey. And I'm going to just show a couple of, of graphs. Um, the graph on the left uh, actually combines uh, information from another module of uh, the UNICEF mix survey, which uh, asks some basic questions on fundamental uh, literacy and numeracy uh, skills. This is specifically on, on reading. It compares uh, these countries uh, from the uh, point of view of the percentage of students who have, of young people, uh, whether they're in school or not, who have achieved uh, the most rudimentary reading skills. And you see from that uh, gaps, uh, they're not very significant in the poorest countries. And that's because, as you see, the level of students who reach these minimum uh, reading skills is extremely, extremely low. Uh, but uh, among countries that have higher uh, uh, levels of skills, you see that this gap is, is widening and can be quite significant uh, in some countries like Kyrgyzstan, for instance. The right hand side uh, shows the, uh, uh, the percentage of uh, students who are out of school uh, and compares at three levels, primary, lower secondary and upper secondary, compares students without any functional difficulty with some functional difficulty and the subset of those who have sensory, physical, or intellectual difficulty. And that is interesting in the sense that uh, it shows, and it suggests, you can, you can read in, in that, that the addition of the questions from the child functioning model, the, what I was mentioning before, the, the Washington Group's questions, um, actually has introduced, has broadened the, the group of uh, uh, children and young people that are identified as having um, uh, some functional difficulty, because it includes not just sensory, physical, or intellectual 
uh, um, disabilities, but also um, questions related to uh, anxiety or, or, or stress that uh, really have broadened that definition. That's why in some cases, some of these comparisons show that uh, children with some function difficulty do not appear to be doing much worse than um, children with without functional difficulty. But if you further look into uh, the, the entire group uh, um, and distinguish between those with uh, the more, let's say, medical in some sense definition of, of disability, you see these um, uh, gaps widening. Coming to the uh, recommendations, to or continue with the recommendations of the report. A key recommendation is that we need to put students at the center of the inclusion project because inclusion is an experience is a process as i mentioned before it's not just a result um, and we should not just limit education to fulfilling uh, children and young people's right to learn but also contributing to their right to be in good health to be happy and connected with others so schools are a key environment for the development of children's well-being and it is actually one of the findings of the report that head teachers who should be at the forefront of instilling inclusive, uh, an inclusive ethos in, in their uh, school actually are rarely ever trained, let alone even selected on the basis of their skills to achieve that. So a sense of belonging is, is vital, um, especially for vulnerable children. And that means that diversity in schools is key to strengthen social cohesion. When it comes to financing, uh, finance, governance and financing uh, can play a very important role in that respect um, for inclusion and for equity. Of course, the way we achieve equity uh, in education systems uh, is very varied. It comes from so many different uh, mechanisms and so many different uh, policies. This graph that I have borrowed from um, the uh, a recent report by uh, Eurydice, the, the, the network that uh, brings together European countries uh, to uh, peer dialogue mechanisms, a very, very important function, uh, shows a very wide range of, of policies that can be used. But one of them is related to financing. And it's very important for general funding mechanism, especially when the center of government allocates resources to uh, different districts or even sometimes different schools to recognize the different needs that schools have uh, and adapt the funding to those and not, not offer flat uh, mechanisms. But it's also important to target funding towards the furthest uh, behind. Uh, since uh, the 1990s, for instance, uh, education attainment has increased among the poorest in particular by up to a year and a half, thanks to cash transfer programs in Latin America, which have been conditioned on uh, the attendance in school. So offering an incentive to, uh, to make progress in that respect. And yet we, um, and it's very important, and I'll come to that later, it's, it's very important that how we interpret targeting of funding. Uh, in some cases, because targeting is really based on, uh, on labeling and on, on classification of groups, that has led often to perverse incentives for, uh, for parents uh, and for schools or for districts to over-report special needs and make inclusive education become costlier than it need be. So it's, it's very, very important to be very careful in the design. So our uh, interpretation, our, our, uh, the way we have described um, targeting is uh, perhaps best exemplified by this graph, which uh, is included in a policy paper uh, that we uh, just launched uh, last month. This shows um, seven different countries um, with respect to two different policies. One is uh, sub providing support to tuition, covering some of the potential fees that are um, exist in, in their respective countries. Um, and also that's the, the purple line and that the, the blue lines are other school related supports. And these uh, analysis uh, also based from UNICEF mix uh, data shows how these policies are targeted where they whether they exist first of all and how they are targeted between the poorest uh, the, the different five let's say five quintiles five different uh, groups um, of uh, households organized by uh, a measure of um, their assets and their wealth uh, 
And you see, for instance, in a country like Algeria, uh, these, um, the, the, these respective policies exist. They're not you know, very, very broad, but they are, they are quite sizable and they're reasonably well targeted. So you see that in both cases, the poorest 40, um, among the poorest 20%, almost 40% are reached uh, with the policy, whereas only 10% uh, of the richest are reached. It still suggests leakage. It means, you know, um, one in 10 of the richest uh, students do benefit from these policies, uh, whereas by contrast, six out of 10 of the poorest are not reached. But at least there's a clear attempt to make such uh, policies equitable. Um, you see, to some extent, the same happening, for instance, in Costa Rica. By contrast, you see a country like Georgia um, or Thailand, where some measures are really very widespread, but that means they're also uh, not properly targeted. You see as many as seven out of 10 in Georgia and in uh, Thailand among the richest uh, population benefiting from a policy that presumably should only have been targeted at the poorest. One policy in, in Georgia of school teaching support even benefits the richest more than the poorest. And you see countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo or Zimbabwe having basically no policy whatsoever uh, to help the, the poorest um, uh, or the most vulnerable populations. But financing is not just about uh, the money and the targeting. It's also about the pooling of resources. Because if we uh, think that essentially what we're trying to achieve is um, a policy on inclusion that tries to ensure that every child can go to their local school and benefit from uh, equal treatment there. Um, we know already that laws in a quarter of countries say that children with disabilities should be educated in separate settings. So there's a long way to go in many education systems. But if we're to move in that direction, then there's a big management challenge. So education systems and schools should have inclusive in-school support, uh, different resources being available to them to fulfill uh, their functions, avoiding what has often been the case targeted exclusionary and medically oriented approaches that really end up excluding rather than helping. So governments should be encouraging flexibility in the use of special resources that often used to be available in special schools. And indeed, a number of uh, countries are moving in that direction. They are converting their uh, special schools into resource centers and uh, also uh, use other mechanisms like in poorest countries, especially itinerant teachers who may be moving from school to school uh, to, uh, to support uh, the children's, children that need such support. So inclusion can often be a management challenge. Also, it's very important to engage in meaningful consultation because inclusion is a, a very context specific um, concept that cannot be easily enforced from the top. You really need um, parents and local communities to embrace it. Um, the report has this um, example that reminds us that 15% of parents in Germany and a much higher percentage uh, in Hong Kong uh, actually think that having children with disabilities in the school of their child will harm their child. Uh, so, and we also have a very interesting experience from, from Germany where a probably hurried attempt to introduce inclusive education uh, in one of the country's largest uh, federal states uh, met with such uh, opposition that it ended up even becoming a political issue and leading the government at the time to lose the election. Um, so governments should be really encouraging communities' input into uh, policy development, should listen to their uh, demands and their, their um, challenges, um, should interact with communities, and should keep guardians, parents, and families informed of the, the rights. There are countries in this world where decisions are being made for children without even uh, parents being aware and, and signing uh, to such decisions. So um, one uh, interesting example that I quote here, a statistic uh, is a study from Queensland, but that uh, is a, it's a difficult uh, type of study to do, but uh, that's particularly interesting how they showed that 37% of students in special schools had actually moved back from mainstream schools. And a lot of that uh, 
uh, exit from mainstream schools happens at transitions uh, because systems may have been developed in primary school but not in secondary school. Cooperation is key uh, for uh, different government departments. Uh, inclusion, as you also uh, say in the outline for this, uh, for this week, is uh, in education is a subset of social inclusion in general. So ministries must collaborate uh, to identify needs as early as possible and exchange information to design integrated programs. In Colombia, we have an example where social programs are tied to a multi-dimensional poverty index, and that brings together registries that cover um, um, minorities um, um, of indigenous groups, uh, internally displaced people, and also uh, poor households, and therefore interventions can be really coordinated. That's with respect to the um, horizontal collaboration, but another important collaboration that needs to take place is vertically. Uh, governments uh, often, uh, in many countries, uh, delegate the responsibility for education services and inclusive education services in particular to local governments, but do not make sure at the same time that they offer clear mandates that are adequately funded and with proper capacities. And in some countries, Indonesia is an example, evidence has shown that increased decentralization has actually led to exacerbated uh, disparities because not all governments have the same uh, ability to raise uh, revenues uh, to fulfill their, uh, their mandates. Cooperation of governments should extend also to the non-government sector. Civil society, and a range of organizations, whether they're development uh, organizations or organizations that have been supporting the rights of, of people with disabilities, have been instrumental in playing two roles. First, uh, acting as watchdogs, uh, holding governments to account for their commitments and speaking loud and providing information. As we know now, there are mechanisms uh, as part of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that uh, uh, listen to also the voices of civil society. Um, and that space needs to be protected. Conditions need to enable NGOs to continue playing that role. Um, but NGOs also play a role in advocating, in providing also services, uh, sometimes on contract, uh, sometimes um, on their own initiative, filling gaps where governments do not reach. And there, what is very important, and we can mention all sorts of examples from uh, community schools in Afghanistan that have really helped girls access school uh, to uh, NGOs working to help street children. Uh, the range is really vast. So it's very important to maintain that dialogue with NGOs, but also to make sure that what they do is aligned with national policy, because often some NGOs move um, in a tangent and uh, follow practices um, that really do not uh, line up very well with uh, national policies that aim to mainstream inclusion. One interesting example of a, a NGO uh, work and campaign over the years that has resulted in, in a national inclusive education uh, program has been uh, Armenia uh, that is currently underway. Universal design is, a, of course, a huge topic in inclusive education. It has been associated primarily with uh, infrastructure how our buildings uh, are, are, are built in our uh, environments to make sure that nobody is excluded. So the design, one design is really suitable for everyone. Um, it has been extended in um, um, interpreting that also for, um, for learning uh, content, uh, for learning, so universal design for learning uh, is how you can make uh, learning material, the form of it, in, in uh, ways that are accessible for all children. But in the report, we also go a step beyond that and we interpret it also in terms of the contents. All children should learn from the same flexible, relevant and accessible curriculum. And there should be alignment between the curriculum and then with the textbooks and with assessments. And often uh, this link is broken. Textbooks should avoid stereotypes at omissions. One example here shows how in um, Punjab uh, province of Pakistan, 
only a quarter of text and images in secondary school textbooks were of women. But that is not just specific to Pakistan. Uh, similar studies even in Spain, for instance, have, have shown similar, sometimes even worse results. Um, an assessment should not be used uh, as a punitive mechanism. It should be there to demonstrate, to allow students to demonstrate their learning in various ways. And there's a long way to go. Of course, we talk about reasonable accommodations for children with disabilities, but assessment is a much broader issue uh, um, and its uh, use uh, and relevance for inclusive education has not been widely discussed. In fact, staying on this topic of uh, curriculum and textbooks, I think that in many ways, the, um, the chapter of the global report on curriculum textbooks and assessment is perhaps the most uh, interesting in the sense that it raises the most interesting questions and, and, uh, and tensions. And some of those were described also in the uh, uh, readings that uh, I recommended. There are, of course, countries that still pay lip service. They may use language related to inclusion, but in practice um, exclude. That could be even in the case of disability, when in a mainstream school, two parallel curricula are being used or some children are still being um, um, led to a separate class in the same school. Um, the same problem is particularly um, important uh, in minority education. Some countries try to protect minorities, but in, in you know, offering them schools in their own language um, and sometimes their own curriculum, but that is often not the, the best solution, especially to help ease tensions in, in conflict settings or post-conflict settings. Intercultural curricula, which are also relevant for uh, integrating and including migrants, uh, remain an exception. Citizenship education is very important. And that's also an area where a lot of tensions arise. I'm not going to say uh, much. I would refer you to, to the report, but often there's uh, not lack of consensus and agreement of what education systems really are trying to do. And sometimes imported versions of citizenship class with how um, uh, teachers may perceive them and, uh, and students may understand them. There has been a regression worldwide in uh, curricula and textbooks on issues of gender equality and also sexual orientation, gender identity. And individualized education plans, as I was mentioning just a moment ago, which are, of course, the norm when it comes to uh, uh, special education needs, um, the implementation is often problematic, leading to more exclusion than it should be. But no, that's not to say that they're not several examples all around the world of flexibility really working to students advantage the report has for instance uh, examples of nomadic education uh, that, um, that seem to be particularly uh, uh, noteworthy education workforce is perhaps the most uh, the key and the recommendation that all teachers should be prepared to teach all students is really a fundamental to report perhaps uh, the second most important one uh, one quarter of teachers reported high need for training on teaching students with special needs, uh, according to uh, the 2018 uh, TALIS, the Teaching and Learning International Survey of the OECD. Um, inclusion should be a core part of initial and in-service training. It should not be a specialist topic, just as I was mentioning earlier, with an inclusive education department, you're not solving uh, the challenge of inclusion in countries. Unfortunately, such uh, courses do not exist and often universities and teacher education institutions do not have the incentives because competencies in inclusion are not required for teacher licensing and certification. Ensuring a diverse education workforce is necessary um, and there are relatively few countries that offer sufficient incentives for this uh, to happen. In some countries with um, aging teaching forces, we have the additional challenge of how our training systems need to be adjusted to take this problem into account. And support personnel are not often lacking. That means also both professionals and also teaching assistants, but also their roles are often not clearly defined. They're there to support teachers, but often uh, segregation continues and such personnel take ultimate responsibility for students, which should never be the case. I'm not going to say much uh, about uh, the COVID-19. You know uh, already that um, it has uh, really um, been a particularly challenging uh, issue for inclusion in recent um, months. The report already from the beginning uh, 
showed that there was a, a, a challenge for some of the world's poorer countries to provide adequate response uh, in terms of adjusting materials to uh, speakers of minority languages or offering um, support to students with disabilities. Uh, I mean, the, I could go on, uh, I don't need perhaps to say much. One thing that for sure is that data collection systems have been challenged. There are various data sources uh, that cast lights to uh, different aspects uh, of this crisis. But uh, the truth is that we're really uh, struggling. Uh, there are some interesting information emerging from, from phone surveys or from uh, subject, subjective surveys of teachers. Um, there are, I think, often insightful uh, coverage on the media. And those, there's also research that is extremely important, highlighting psychological impacts of the crisis, home support that is lacking, um, and that's on top of the material support that is lacking, the lack of peer effects in, uh, during this period, uh, all these aspects that can really lead uh, to exclusion become um, uh, further entrenched. I'm, I'm finishing now with um, the last recommendation and just a very, very brief introduction uh, to some of our resources for those of you who may not be familiar. Uh, the last recommendation of the report is that uh, a shift to inclusion is not easy, exactly because it is a process, and therefore it is extremely important to learn from peers. And that's from at all levels, from the school level, teachers should be encouraged to speak to each other, but also to uh, moving to the national level, the regional and the global level. What we have done is to have uh, these three uh, resources. Uh, two are new, one is much, much older. Um, I'll just briefly take you through them for your benefit. We introduced uh, the peer website, which stands for Profiles Enhancing Education Reviews, uh, with the launch of the report in 2020. Essentially, what we tried to do was to make sure that uh, we uh, show that the report has covered all countries, even though the report itself, the text, only selects some examples, but to offer a resource uh, that people can refer to if they want to see where the world stood on this important issue at a certain point in time. So uh, we have 160 country uh, profiles on law, how countries, laws, and policies uh, are addressing uh, inclusion in education. And the, the main purpose is really to help prompt uh, and support policy dialogue, which often happens in vacuum. We have not included European countries because they are served by the Eurydice resources that I mentioned earlier. Um, so that's one of the resources. The second resource for those of you who may, may be more quantitatively oriented uh, is our uh, Scoping Progress in Education, our SCOPE website, which is the online counterpart to the monitoring part of the report. We have summarized the key stories, let's say, on progress in international education uh, we, with five narratives on access, equity, learning, quality, and finance. There are interactive um, uh, graphs that you can uh, go through and make comparisons of countries between time, between, between countries and over time. And also you can find links to the SDG4 monitoring framework and the UAS data set that is the custodian for most of these uh, indicators. And finally, uh, as Tony was mentioning, we have our World Inequality Database on Education, which exists already now for more than 10 years. Uh, it's a resource that, again, for more than 160 countries, disaggregates key education indicators um, on, uh, of access, participation, but also learning by six characteristics and potentially more in the future and their intersections and provides also different ways of uh, representing and visualizing that inequality, both in absolute and relative uh, terms. Finally, a reminder that we have a number of resources for those of you who may want to use uh, um, our materials for uh, promoting the messages on inclusive education. The report, as I mentioned, is available in four languages, the summary in uh, uh, 30. Um, we have the youth and the gender edition, and also two regional reports that were published um, in the last few months, one on Latin America and the Caribbean, and one on Central and Eastern Europe, the Caucasus and Central Asia, both of them in partnership with um, more specialized uh, institutions in those parts of the world. I've also added uh, an image of our animation and our video and also the, uh, the cartoons that can also be used for, for uh, advocacy.
So that brings me to the end. Um, I hope I didn't speak too long. Uh, a reminder of the three core reports that you can consult. It's interesting how the regional editions look at the same issues and, and refine and uh, adjust to the needs. It's an experience for us that has also been very, uh, very interesting. I invite you to, to take a look as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Manos. I think that we can clap <laughs> with the. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a perfect uh, presentation. Very comprehensive. Uh, you covered many many aspects of of the theme of inclusion, and I'm really glad that you gave this policy perspective to the to the topic, which is what we really uh, try to to develop in the context of, of Globet. You refer to inclusion as, a, as an experience, as a process, but it's also clear that inclusion is a social norm um, that is more and more accepted. But as we know, sometimes social norms uh, take time to translate into practice. And, and I think that the work that you are doing in UNESCO and, and these resources that you are putting together maybe can accelerate this process of uh, reducing the gap between the normative domain and the practice domain. And I, I think it's very interesting how you are putting together these initiatives to promote policy learning between countries and, and best practice uh, approaches. So uh, I think all of us here are very interested in this type of resources and we will have a look at them definitely. There are some clarification questions in the chat. Please feel free to, to add them. I think that you may have responded to, to some of them as the last one from, from Anna relating to the monitoring, but you also have more maybe uh, difficult questions related on how to collect data on, on minority groups um, without potentially stigmatizing them. That's from Megan. And, and Lucia is um, making a question on whether you consider including the voices of, uh, of children or, or in this case, uh, excluded uh, groups when producing the reports. Very good question. So let me take them bottom up. So um, whether UNESCO collects data and evaluate the extent of implementation um, of the GEM report in particular? No, um, the, the, the report is available there. Um, we are, of course, um, uh, constantly pressed by our, our donors to uh, demonstrate impact at the country level from what we do. But you can imagine that that's quite a, um, quite a you know, big ask because you cannot expect one, one small team of a few people uh, working from an office in Paris to be directly held accountable for policy change. You know, whoever actually asks that doesn't know what, how policies change. Policies require thousands of people to be mobilized and for the demand to be in country for that to happen. So what, what the report can do is to make messages clear um, communicate them, which is in itself difficult. Uh, I always refer to the example of our accountability report, where we, we needed messages on accountability that spanned countries that had no accountability, and there are many of those, to countries that had too much accountability. So how do you pitch uh, your message in a way that responds well is you know, very, very difficult. Um, so it's in, what we have been trying to do, and that's the the strategy the report has had in recent years is to uh, try and go a step between the global and the national because we cannot reach we just don't have the resources we're like a, a small team uh, of uh, you know smaller team than you are now um, uh, on, on on this call uh, so we've basically tried to follow <laughs> yeah, yeah, Sorry, I, interrupted you. I mean uh... I have been doing my internship in global citizenship education, and I have actually been using your report to make some of the publications from field offices more inclusive, especially teachers' manuals. So this is one of the way how you can actually implement it. 
So, so as I said, the, the main way is for us to work at the regional level. So we, we try started publishing regional reports and we have started introducing these country profiles that we hope uh, with the intermediation of some regional organizations can also get uh, country ownership uh, because I, ultimately that's, uh, that's the key. So we're just trying to adapt what we do in ways that could be taken up more easily. And of course, we, we never stop our communication. Uh, we are 20 people, but uh, essentially only 10 work on research. Uh, we have a, you know, a team of people that really tries to work very hard to uh, you know, uh, help with the messaging, um, help with the communication, uh, the social media, the, the traditional media, the, 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 uh, you know, the, the publications to be made available in different languages. It's, it's a whole machinery of people that without that you cannot reach. Uh, so that's what we can emphasize. In terms of formally uh, following up on these messages, uh, in theory, there is a global education architecture that should take uh, note and, and try to uh, promote those messages. It's not working very well uh, in that sense. It's, it's relatively weak. And uh, the, the UNESCO is currently trying to improve that architecture. The problem is, that it's difficult. Education is not easily amenable for a global debate. I think that let's put it that way. Uh, it, it can be very context specific. Generally speaking, education is one of those fields of national uh, prerogative where no country wants to be told how its education system should be from the outside. So it's only if there is domestic request and demand for, for change and we know how, uh, complicated it is to make any progress in education. Education tends to be quite conservative because you need to compromise very different worldviews in every single uh, country. So you can imagine how that translates also at the global level. But the, we, we think that at the regional level, there is more scope, but again, there needs to be something that ties them. For, for us, uh, the experience of the European Union and how it has approached European uh, education policy issues has been quite a positive example that we believe deserves wider attention um, and we try to generally to promote it so we try to encourage regional organizations to, to take more leadership uh, for their parts of the world uh, formulate clearly what they want to do and build platforms to uh, engage countries to discuss uh, openly not not uh, not obliging them to do now i do take the 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 additional perspective though that there are also some global mechanisms through the UN Human Rights uh, Council and uh, and the committees on uh, the different conventions that have also been uh, quite uh, influential it's just that they're quite specific I think if one wants to talk about education in general it's quite difficult uh, to to use those uh, processes uh, let's say effectively um, but from our point of view, it is a huge struggle to monitor how many of these findings are being taken up, uh, because you never know when you know a seed, a little seed is planted in some policymakers' heads. In how, in what channel have they heard? Have they made the connection? Who has influenced them? It's a very complicated process that we really uh, cannot possibly uh, follow. Uh, on children' perspectives. Uh, uh, that is a difficult one to feature in a global report. Uh, so we're a little bit concerned with that. So what we do instead is uh, around the time of the, the launch of the report, we have, we communicate uh, the, the reports and its messages through all sorts of spokespeople. Um, and for instance, for the last report, we had champions of uh, inclusive education around the world that were essentially transferring uh, these voices um, of their struggles, uh, of uh, at what point they were instrumental in helping bring change. Um, so that's, I think, the closest we can come uh, through parallel work that we do, uh, that we feature through our blogs, um, and sometimes through articles in, in newspapers that uh, feature their voices. Um, so for instance, we had some interesting uh, Roma voices uh, for the last uh, reports uh, that were really bringing to life uh, some of the core messages. But given that our report is research-based and also has the uh, 
expectation that is comparative, uh, it's quite difficult to bring uh, individual voices to, to make it, uh, you know, to fit, let's say, the style of the report. But of course, that, that, that by no means suggested, we don't think it's extremely important. That's why we're encouraging uh, countries' uh, information systems to really look at what students have to say and take that seriously and into account in their, um, in their overall monitoring. Uh, in, uh, how do you collect data without um, labels that could potentially be stigmatized? That's a very important question. Um, I think the, there's one, there are very few examples uh, of that happening, but the, the one that we highlight in the report is Portugal. Uh, Portugal um, has championed its approach to inclusive education in recent years, and uh, essentially their resource allocation process is really based on, on need and not on categories. So schools report the, the needs they have and resources are allocated to those needs. So that's it's a really dramatically different way of, of uh, designing an education system. It seems to be working. Of course, uh, that takes time to, you know, we need much more because the law was only passed in 2018. But it is a, it, it is a radically different way of approaching the issue. As I mentioned, historically, in recent years, the attempt to allocate resources on the basis of, of categories, because uh, so many students have um, autism spectrum disorder, and so many students have uh, attention deficit, and so many students have this, has led to a vast expansion uh, in the number of uh, needs. Also, uh, parents, as I said, um, sometimes play around these definitions to get additional support for their children that may, they may not deserve. So there are so many perverse incentives in um, labeling and classifications of medical kind that uh, it's really very important. And some countries are indeed, and Portugal is not one, but it's just because it's quite comprehensive. I mentioned it as an example, are trying to move uh, away from it. How can you help hold of these publications? Uh, I can add the links um, to... Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Manos. I think that these uh, answers were very, uh, very complete. It's clear that, yeah, we need better information systems to identify which are which are the vulnerable groups to to target, and not only in southern countries, also in in European countries, we have many lacunas on on this. And as you said, without this information, we cannot make uh, targeted policies and and other type of formula based. Uh, policies. And maybe now it's time to, to give the floor to the group of students that have prepared a special uh, comments and questions for you that in the, in the case of this session are uh, Lea, Ala, Leini, Lisette and Yasser. I don't know how you want to, to proceed, but the floor is yours. Uh, should we go in order? I think I'm the first. Then, okay. Um, thank you for the very dense presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I really like also the reading you suggested, and especially the two readings um, the one from Silver on social inclusion and the one from Rogers Lee. So I wanted to uh, react to these two. Um, so, for the reading um, from Silver on social inclusion, um, I thought it was quite interesting to look at inclusion from a broader perspective, not only inclusion education, but social inclusion. And um, while in the last days we saw inclusion as quite a universal concept, which everyone um, understands as the same it wants to achieve, I thought it was interesting that the author argued that it isn't and that inclusion and ex exclusion are very context specific and they are influenced by economic, social, and political dimension in one country. So not only the long language about inclusion can change, but also the ideology behind it. So I thought it was interesting to see what um, inclusion in education could mean in different countries and contexts and what different programs can emerge from these different definitions. So it was nice to see this different perspective from the two previous day of um, class that we had. Um, also, the article echoes yesterday presentation on uh, spatial, spatial segregation in the cities and how it affects disadvantaged groups to move up the social ladder. 
Um, I, I thought it was interesting when the author mentions that in some studies that they did, some families resisted inclusion efforts uh, from the state and they would go back to their, sometimes to their poorer uh, neighborhoods because they think that social ties and community solidarity is more important than inclusion. So I thought that was a really good point. And uh, it relates to what you said in your presentation about um, inclusion cannot be enforced from the top um and why the state want, might want to promote inclusion in schooling um, and mix individuals um we have to consider the agency of these groups uh, themselves so i thought it was a really good point uh now on roger Lee uh, article um well first of all i really like his strong position and and tone and criticism in the article um and how he he was showing that uh, the the tactics and the hidden agendas that can uh, live behind the term inclusive education, and um, the two parts um, which which I resonated with the most in the article is when he mentions that yes we want inclusion but inclusion for what. Um, stakeholders usually say we are moving towards inclusion, but what is the fin that final stage that we're aiming for? Um, inclusion, inclusion itself shouldn't be an end. Um, it reminds me of other buzzwords that we use in the development field and education policy, but we don't know what's the, what's the end of it. Uh, I also like at the very end of the article, um, his reflection and his position on the fact that researchers should should be partisan and researchers should take position for things to to change. So that um, that reflection on uh, positionality of the researcher was um, really interesting during for me because we are in the process of uh, doing our thesis and I thought it, um, it's it's interesting to see that um, as a researcher we can also be um, yeah a partisan and engage in our work. Um, so yeah, thank you. I can go next. Um, so first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, and also, I think Leo already said some points I also had in mind uh, because reading this article, I couldn't help but reflect on my own experience, both as an educator and as a student part in the Romanian education system. So I would like to um, mention four points. Uh, so first one, if I may quote the article, it says uh, play specific ideas are embedded in institutions that both contains individual choices and shape behaviors. And I, uh, this made me think of the situation of Roma community in Romania, where theoretically at policy level, there are some mechanisms put in place to include these people, but because of the historical context, some communities will choose not to send their children to school. And I find this is a very uh, a big problem in the idea that it's very difficult to tackle, to kind of shift their perspective uh, to what education it's worth and why they should send their children in the first place. Uh, because as I said, for example, even in tertiary education, there are special, like, places allocated for this community so they don't even have to compete with everyone else and also um, cash transfers and so on. So there are some policies in place there. And then my second point, as uh, Leo already mentioned, it's how our understanding of what inclusion means vary depending on context, right? So for example, how in Europe, uh, um, inclusion of religious minority, it's more of a problem than in Eastern Europe, let's say, and how like in the North, uh, it's less important your economical background than in the South of Europe. And this made me think of, uh, of a UNICEF program, a pilot program that was um, developed in, in Romania uh, on social inclusion. And I think that a very good initiative for the Romanian context because they targeted um, students for disadvantaged communities and helped them get uh, documents so they can enroll in school. So even if the schools were there, there were other barriers that uh, blocked their access. 
uh, unfortunately, this program was was successful. Uh, I mean, fortunately, it was successful in that community, but it was not implemented at national level. Uh, and the pessimistic side of me thinks that it won't, uh, not because it's expensive, but because uh, it requires a lot of human resources to go to all this uh, far away places, and it's hard to find people who can cover a whole country. Uh, so I'm not sure how uh, how this can go forward, uh, right? And then um, just a second, <laughs> I lost my thought. Um, and I think that um, it's 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 interesting to think about it's how inclusion affects the already included people. Uh, so, for example. When I was studying in Russia, I was working as a part-time English teacher in a school that was inclusive. So uh, they had children with learning disabilities and physical disabilities in the classrooms with everyone else. And as a part-time teacher, I did not have any training in how to deal with these children. So uh, somebody decided to take my class uh, a boy with learning difficulties and I was there faced with that and I had no idea how to deal with it. I dealt with it at the best of my abilities, but what I noticed is the impact that the presence of this child had on his peers, that they, they get to learn that they don't live in this bubble where everybody is conventionally perfect. Uh, and I think this is very important for us as individuals to, uh, from a young age, to be exposed to a variety of of people so we don't grow up being um, opposed to inclusion, basically. Um, yeah, and then just to end, I'd have a question. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that um, there are different, so there are different groups that are being excluded. So for example, poor young women in rural areas or LGBTQ children who don't feel safe in their school. And as I mentioned, like. Roma communities in Romania because of their uh, behavior and uh, historical context. Um, so this feels to me like an exclusion ca uh, caused by the beliefs of that community or how a larger community makes the people uh, like minorities feel. So how can this problem be addressed? And like from your perspective, what is one practical thing that can be done to make this this better and who should do it. Thank you. Thank you. I, th I think I was next. Was I? Yeah, I don't remember what the order was. Um, so yeah. thank you for uh, being with us today and uh, your comments were uh, so interesting. I'll start with two questions so I don't forget to say them and then I'll make my general comments. Um, the first, I am wondering, just it's based off my own teaching experience, and that context is mostly in the United States. And what I was, what I'm noticing, is a trend in um, specific diagnoses in students' individual education plans regarding mental health. And just in my seven years of teaching, I noticed more and more every year the you know, disability that was having that student receive this these um, accommodations was, you know, anxiety, depression, uh, those elements. And I, I'm wondering if you're seeing that um, happening globally or, or whatnot, because that's, uh, when we think of inclusive education, in my own teacher training, when I, I had one course that was uh, about special education needs. And it was it was basically like a medical course. It was about if you have a student that has X disability, treat them this way, like very clinically, there was no, nothing about diversity, nothing about any of the other elements of inclusion, um, which I think is really telling. But then when I was in the teaching field, the diagnoses I was getting was totally different. Um, so I was just wondering that was that. And then the second question that I have is, I know in the report you have um, a whole chapter that was about inclusive curriculum, uh, which I, I really appreciated because that is something that is so fascinating to me. And I was wondering if you could just um, elaborate a little bit more on um, 
some of the findings that you had in there. And what I'm wondering is how do we get past, um, not, not that it isn't relevant at all, but what I'm sort of seeing happening is, is okay, let's just have pictures of more diverse people in textbooks. And that, that solves inclusivity, that that's it. We did it, it's seen, but how do we get to inclusive pedagogy where every element of your classroom is inclusive and it's not just this one element. Um, I was wondering if you had examples or or trends that you could speak to. And um, now to my general comments. Um, so something that I, I really appreciated in the readings you provided was I felt like each one was very, very different and what it was approaching. One was about deconstruction of language and one um, was talking about the social context. And it was provide making it actually sort of difficult to prepare my comments because I thought how do I address <laughs> there's so many different elements that you um, put in um, but what I sort of am seeing happening is I think when we think of inclusive education I'm seeing two sort of trends happening one is it's being revealed to me that there are lots of conflicting notions there's we should we shouldn't label students because that um, you know that can be harming uh, however labeling students also can give them access to things that they may need. Um, it can give information to governments. Um, we should train teachers to have more skills to uh, approach these students and include them. But also we shouldn't be teaching teachers that that's a specific skill set you need for that student. It can apply to everyone. And it, it feels like there's all these conflicting pieces that leads to a lot of gray area that leads to inaction or just confusion. And the other thing that I, I see happening is almost putting everything in different sil like silos instead of looking at it as a whole system. Um, and one of the in one of the readings there was a line that was really impactful to me that was, you know, in a lot of countries, education as a system wasn't built to be inclusive. Um, and so if our society isn't inclusive, how do we expect our, it's very ambitious to think our schools would be inclusive spaces because if it's operating from that notion, um, how does it move forward in that way? Um, so those are sort of the two trends that I, I see happening that I thought um, were, were really interesting and compelling just on my own reflection of my own experiences, you know, uh, like Ala said, as a student and then as a teacher, you just see like, oh, yep, that's why, that's why I did that or that's why that is happening. Um, so thank you. Great. I think okay. now is it? Mm, yes. Um, yeah. Well, um, thank you. Uh, first of all, for the presentation and uh, especially for the report, it's uh, a really great effort and a very useful uh, tool, uh, tool for uh, those as um, are interested in, in the file of education. I think the report uh, shows uh, that the panorama of the inclusion uh, is much uh, broader than just education uh, for people with a special needs or uh, disabilities. And uh, I think it is, it, it, uh, this is important. In fact, the, the data that you present about the perception that uh, two, in, uh, two in 10 students feel like uh, outsiders in schools is I think not only important, but eloquent about uh, how uh, the, the system, the, they are uh, the design education system uh, in the world. As uh, you mentioned uh, in your presentation and uh, how the report present, um, in international declaration commitments of non-discrimination have been made uh, since 1916 and the uh, inclusion size 1990, uh, inclusion permits the 2030 agenda uh, with its call of uh, leave no one behind. And this is uh, strike my, um, and this is uh, strikes me because there is an international agenda, an effort to uh, promote inclusion even more than I thought. 
In fact, um, one of the papers uh, recommended for this session states that the relationship between ide ide uh, ideals and practices in general uh, is weak, uh, which uh, signals, signals a lack of the any real political priority, which is one of the OECD's conclusion. Uh, but despite these uh, statements and the fact that today we have enough information and data, policy recommendation, legal uh, frameworks, in reality, education systems uh, in non-developing countries and in de and developed countries as well have made uh, the necessary um, change to be more truly inclusive as you said, not only for a, a one people, a, a group of people. So, um, so in your monitoring experience, what do you think are the factors uh, why this does not change? Uh, it's just um, a matter of uh, policy implementation. That uh, that is my my first uh, thought and my first question about it. And um, one method, um, more methodological question. Um, in the construction of the report, in addition to the government agencies uh, and the study and sur uh, service, there was participation or consultation or collaboration of communities, uh, minorities, or populations uh, considered ex exclu exclude, because some uh, some of this. Um, communities have organizations and do a work to make the gaps uh, in education visible. Uh, or are the data collection only focused on the implementation of policy? Um, and especially because in the, I think, um, I'm thinking because in, in this, because uh, in the discussion about what exclusion or inclusion is, it can be different at a global level and the local level. And I, I'm thinking precisely in the context like in uh, America Latina uh, from which I come, because uh, the demands of uh, groups like the indigenous uh, black uh, people or in general uh, ethnic communities historically exclude actually, uh, they demand the opposite or a different type of inclusion uh, as they, uh, for example, the, their own parallel and special education systems uh, that respond to their cultural needs and not, um, and they don't want to be part of a single inclusive curriculum, for example. And well, in, and there are cases like uh, uh, Bolivia or Ecuador that recently made uh, reforms to the educational system um, in this way. So well, that's my, my question. Well, that's why I, I give you that reference by silver because precisely um, it sets the, some limits, potential limits. And that's the, the challenge because you have Roger Slee's um, uh, you know, powerful argument that really we have to be ideological about inclusion either we believe in it like to our spine or we're not really going anywhere and we may not be able to define where exactly we're going but we really have to believe in it so it's a it's a, it's a very awkward uh, set of conflicting ways of, of looking at these issues and um, I think that's why in the introduction to the reports we're playing a little bit with that uh, graph or maybe which is quite common in education the equality versus equity um, you know whether you put the, the, the children in different levels in order to be able to watch a game behind the, the fence so we uh, we kind of start by questioning that i think uh, uh, maybe the words equality and equity have not been used used uh, correctly in the past in that sense uh, we, we thought of equality as a result and equity as a process. Um, but uh, inclusion is really complicated because it's both. Um, I mean, you describe it as a norm, uh, I think, Tony, but it's, it's a norm is, is essentially a result. It's, it's a norm that we share and we all have. Uh, 
but it's also a process of getting there. So how, what goes first is extremely difficult. And I think your questions, um, I, I find hard to remember who said what, because we three people start with an L and then the, the fourth person has two L's in their names. <laughs> if, if I am not wrong, we still have a person with a Y. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so it's the fifth person coming. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Apologies. Maybe, uh, yeah, a bit short. Is that, so that's bit. yes, sir. Um, Hello. Yes, it's not so fun to be the last one. <laughs> I already say, but I will be really concise. I have two questions about the presentation. One general comment about the reading and one personal comment about the topic uh, of, uh, well, thank you for the presentation, first of all. Uh, with, your, well, with the presentation, the presentation of Mondays, we can see that there is not homogeneity in the concept of uh, inclusive education. And when, what I was wondering is how does affect or not affect, I don't know, the evaluation of educational system and the collection of data, because sometimes the data is presented aggregated. And is, you know, the, the, the concept is not hom homogeneous in the in the in different syst uh, educational systems was my first question. And the second is one you talk about cash transfer programs in Latin America, like target financing. Uh, this program focus on access no, and enrollment of, of, of learners and students, uh, but in North topic about quality, um, also in terms of inclusion, the integration of these uh, vulnerable groups. So what else can be invested in, in besides, you know, uh, uh, programs of access like cash transfer, and infrastructure that I think that is the most um, easy way to see the, 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 the inclusive education because I think that all the lectures always get more importance. No, no importance. Uh, they talk more about uh, persons with disabilities. So the infrastructure in the schools are really important. So what other policy will be important to invest to an inclusive education? It was my question and about the readings. It was really interesting, the four and also the order, because when you start to read about the role of the teachers in inclusive education, it's really like uh, they, 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 the paper make you wonder and reflect about this ideal inclusive education overloads the responsibility of the teacher, I, I think. Because um, even in this paper, they talk about three elements that the teacher has to has to um, to they need to achieve the inclusive, and they talk about believing, you know, like believing that I can do it, believing that I and it's it's nice to read it. It's, it's a really inspirational, I don't know, uh, uh, diagram about the believing, knowing, doing. I don't remember the three, but the the the, the word believing is like. Okay, I can believe that I can do it. I can believe with my skills, I can incorporate with this, but okay, tell that to a professor in a rural area in Latin America that has to teach 60 people and has to teach five, uh, five subjects. So yeah, he, he, she believes, but so it was really interesting that lecture. And then the other three is more from the ideal to the real and they, well, in that part, they, they, they construct the, this ideal concept, and it's really interesting. I, I really like the order of the lecture that you recommend. Um, and I think that, well, personally, <laughs> I think that inclusive education, you say in the presentation, that was thought, like, uh, thought with um, like a learner-centered approach, no? but. I think for now, for me, I am not an expert, that in the end, I think that the learner is a little bit forgotten because they, in the part of, you know, this concept, this idea, this goal for international organization for government, they forget a little the topics really strong about the stigma, discrimination that they suffer, the difficulties of integration, the quality of their education, because yes, they are more people included in the mainstream system, but 
what is the cost of this for them, you know, because it's a learner center approach, but I think that sometimes the, the learner, uh, I don't want to say feelings, emotion, but the learner uh, wealth is forgetting a little. And my last comment is a personal comment too. I think that is important, uh, necessary to underline the importance of non-formal and informal education with this topic about discrimination and stigma because as you said in the presentation, it's not only a topic of responsibilities to teachers, to principals, to the educational system. It's a topic that has to be important for community. And sometimes, for example, Liz say, and it's totally true, but in certain cases, for example, talking about pregnant teenagers or other communities that also need to be included, they don't, they don't say, I don't want to, uh, I mean, I am talking about, for example, my experience in Mexico City, no? They told me something that they want to be in a school in the night, in the evening with pregnant teenagers too. But it's, I th my reflection is, it's not her decision. It's the discrimination that they, that they suffer in the mainstream formal education. So I think that formal and non-formal informal education in the community to attack this topic, about, well, to address this topic about respect to diversity, intolerance, anti-discrimination is, is really important because you can talk and write many things about inclusive education, but sometimes some teachers, some classmates, they don't accept the difference, the diversity. So I think that is really a necessary topic to talk in the community. No, so no, it's just the problem of the teachers. I think that I, they have many responsibilities in this topic, but there is not only the topic of them or the principal or the minister of education. It's a comprehensive topic. It's an integral policies, like you said in the presentation. And I think that lifelong learning, the you know, it's, it's important to talk this topic in the community, not only because they don't want to be part of the mainstream. That that I think that is a really problem to fix it in the in, in this system that already have a structural problem but no i don't want to be in norm in normal school because but they don't say that it's because they are discriminated so i think that is a topic to talk in this inclusive education much and thank you thank you they, these are really excellent uh contribution from all of you really um and i asked the, the silly question where we are all coming from i hadn't seen the, the the back pages of the of the leaflet which i i saw in the meantime so uh, i'm really very pleased that actually we're having this conversation because you really brought your personal experiences to uh to that but i i'm, I'm also glad that you found the readings accessible and um and uh, insightful let's say in this way. Um, I don't know where to start. Uh, all, all I can tell you is that I'm actually relieved that we're leaving the inclusion cycle behind because I did find it the most challenging theme of all those that we had covered, for, precisely for that reason that Yasser was saying at the end, because it's all encompassing, it's covering everything. And uh, conceptualizing it and uh, recognizing all the different angles to which people are coming from and, and trying to give a, a fairly simple message was not that easy. Um, I have to say it was really uh, um, a big struggle. And I think I'm glad that we also had the chance to do the, the two regional editions and be able to reflect more on the questions and the issues that's, that matter. And uh, I hope given that so many of you are actually from the respective region that you will also um, uh, find that uh, relevant or that they will speak more uh, to you. Um, let me try and get to the questions. Um, I, I Definition is not shared, just to start from Yasser's uh, last uh, or first question. But I hope, and I don't know how my presentation contrasted with uh, yesterday's presentation, but I would hope that 
people take that uh, definition that we have provided, which um, really tries to reconcile these two radically different ways, the, the idealistic, uh, which you have to, even if, even if a system settles for one reason or another to segregated systems, and I'll come back to that in a minute, um, at least it's very important how every educator is in particular approaches the learner uh, and sees potential in every learner. I think that's a, um, a problem that most countries have. Uh, and it's true, we cannot build an inclusive education system in a, this, this, um, in a segregated society. And uh, I saw there's someone from Slovakia, I mean, Slovakia in the hearts of Europe, and yet, we see that some of the segregation indices that um, uh, that uh, emerge from the the PISA uh, survey um, are, you know, extremely high and rival those in some of you know the, the Latin American countries with you know high experience of inequality and, and, and segregation, like Peru, for instance. So, um, how do you transform that? It's it's impossible to transform that unless there is a desire. And a reminder that the, there is a special chapter of the report on um, on uh, uh, of the global report on uh, communities, students, and parents in these conflicts and at, uh, attitudes that can really uh, basically derail any efforts by the, even the most uh, well-intentioned policymakers, uh, you know, assuming that there is. A confluence or like a, an alignment of stars, and some government take responsibility in, in that direction. Still, it can be undermined. I was mentioning also the example of, of uh, one of the German states um, of how things got derailed. But but teachers are at the core, and inevitably teachers are not different from any other people. But you would want them to be different, and uh, that's why teacher education systems are, are essential. But the report is full of examples. Uh, in the United States, I think it's a very interesting survey of uh, uh, teacher attitudes over time. And still in 2014, 31% of teachers believed that uh, the, um, you know, it was down to uh, you know, uh, African-Americans' attitudes, the fact that they, uh, they were in the situation they were. So, uh, I mean, it's a huge number if you think about it. Uh, they're, they're mildly less biased than, um, than the average citizen because they're more educated but but still you find very high percentage in brazil we have this very interesting uh, example of research uh, an economist research because of course economists can bring some value to these debates sometimes uh, of how um, uh, brazilian teachers in sao paulo were still uh, biased even you know for for students uh, you know black and white students were of e uh, equal um, uh, performance and, and same behavior, still they were more likely to assign uh, a lower score uh, that would block them from future education opportunities. And that's why ultimately uh, what justifies governments uh, to intervene and, and put some measures that support some groups. Uh, Brazil in particular has had this, um, these measures um, of affirmative action that have worked in terms of opening uh, the doors, at least to post-secondary education for some of these communities. Um, of course, it depends how they're implemented and sometimes they're abused, but a well-designed approach uh, can make uh, a difference. Um, and if we should say, because there was a question, uh, things are not changing, they are changing. Uh, the uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, for instance, the percentage of uh, students that uh, have uh, a disability who have moved out of um, uh, special schools has accelerated. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing, dramatic uh, rate of change in a very short period of time. And of course, that was under the special circumstances of the influence of international organizations, the, the promise and the prospect of access to the European Union um, that, that played a role, but also the Council of Europe has a very consistent message and even other organizations that have tried to uh, heal wounds after uh, the conflicts that the region affect, uh, experienced have also been playing a, a supportive role in, in this message. So progress is happening around the world. Uh, I, th I don't think we should be 
uh, dismissing that aspect. And I think the report has, and the, the three reports as a whole, have, have that, those uh, examples uh, clearly stated. We should not uh, dismiss them. Um, but yes, you are right that we're, miss, we're meeting, we're, we're, we're kind of uh, finding at certain moments uh, the opposition of some communities that should also be respected. Uh, I, resp I repeat, that's why I added the silver um, uh, reference, because we cannot be uh, dogmatic, even though we should have a, a, a dogma as educators in ourselves, that, that commitment to the principle of inclusion should not make us blind to the needs of some communities to, uh, to maintain their identity and, and, uh, and, uh, and respect that. Um, now, this, of course, touches in some in different countries. The religion was mentioned uh, in Western Europe. I, I actually, religion, even in Eastern Europe, is not a clear cut issue because there are countries that um, actually are taking also a fairly um, you know, difficult approach to, to the question. But, but the right of communities, indigenous communities in Latin America, for instance, uh, to, to be uh, having their own bilingual. Uh, um, uh, system and uh, have their own teachers and their own curricula is one that is difficult to argue with, right? Um, if they want to be educated, the question is how you enable, how you make a change gradually uh, to enable intercultural education uh, to happen in a way that is respectful of its others uh, minorities. Chile, for instance, has a bilingual. Uh, has minority schools or cert certain subjects, but even those subjects are only applying to those communities that have at least 20% of the community. So but that, that means it's you're passing a message that's only for them because it's relevant for them, as if the other, uh, the majority community should not know anything about their neighbors, uh, you know, the, and, the, and the, the peers uh, who live in a different community. So, there are ways, but I repeat, we should respect um, minorities' right to preserve their identity. My, my own children grew up in a, in a minority community and really only thrived through the possibility to be educated in the minority language, uh, from which even they actually ended up also learning my language much faster than if they had not had the opportunity. Um, so all these issues are, of course, extremely difficult. We just have to be uh, driven by the principle that we respect every everyone's potential and use different ways. Uh, there was a question, I think, from Allah, what works and what are key messages? Uh, so, so different, many different levels. Uh, Romania, actually, and I was surprised to also find myself, has had um, both a very active civil society, again, sometimes with uh, external support that uh, has been challenged, but uh, very, very influential, that has helped uh, disaggregate some schools. By contrast, other Eastern European countries are still being uh, chased by uh, European courts on their um, on the segregation policies that persist and are, as I said, extreme. So that has worked. And, and then the, the government did adopt a very inclusive curriculum that recognized Roma history like no other country in Europe has done. So there are ways. Now, how that is going to be implemented is, of course, a different question. But unlike, let's say, Bulgaria, where the, 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 the curriculum is still electives, so a few subjects here and there, actually Roma history has entered the mainstream. And now everyone learns um, about Roma history, not just as a victim, like uh, people who were persecuted or they were slaves or they were uh, uh, you know, victims of the Holocaust, but actually as active contributors uh, to the country. Now, how that takes place in other countries is, of course, a much more painful um, uh, top topic. Um, but we should uh, take the, the lessons that Romania can give us, and also the lessons that some other countries have had in the region. Uh, extensive uh, information campaigns that the governments have sponsored, for instance, for including. Um, people with disabilities, people who are exposed to these messages do, do actually get, uh, uh, do, do receive the message. Uh, if you don't pass the message, then nobody will listen to it. But if you do have coordinated efforts, uh, then that is actually ultimately going to trickle. Uh, nobody said it's going to happen overnight. Um, I don't know, I'm just trying to look at the, uh, the, the questions and if I have, Answered. Yeah, there was this uh, specific question about the diagnosis. Um, the report does document, of course, the United States uh, 
is a very uh, particular case uh, in many respects, but um, but it's true, and I, I could refer to the, the report. Um, autism, for instance, is recognized as a condition at the extreme end of a curriculum, of a continuum. And then, you know, you don't know, um, because medical, neither medical nor education considerations give clear guidance where a particular behavior becomes a disorder, because that depends on context. Is it uh, the biochemistry or is it the particular setting, for instance, for deficits, uh, attention deficit disorders? Uh, in some settings, it depends really on the, on the, on the particular condition. For instance, pre-primary education has become increasingly more academic. And even uh, younger children who actually should just be playing now spend more time in school and teachers have expectations and the systems uh, have expectations on teachers that actually uh, children learn particular skills that they were only previously expected to learn in primary school. Um, so what actually determines uh, whether they are having a disorder or whether it's a normal behavior uh, in that particular uh, context? Um, it's, it's really... Uh, difficult to uh, to be very absolute on that. It's true also what we know is that the socioeconomic characteristics um, have driven in many countries, but especially in the United States, uh, such categorization. And um, better off families, for instance, there have been more likely to be able to afford and then seek a diagnosis to ensure uh, that if the child is dyslexic can benefit from, from services and accommodation. There is a, a potential that autism is also in a similar uh, direction with mainly richer families demanding access to services that come with the diagnosis, particularly early intervention. Um, and that pattern was observed as some of the researchers were quoting in the report among all uh, groups, ethnic groups and racial groups, especially among, among Asians. By contrast, um, in Europe, autism was more likely to be diagnosed in, in households with low socioeconomic status. Also, we know from uh, in the US um, that children at a given level of ability were disproportionately more likely to be designated as having an intellectual disability if they belong to one of the racial and ethnic minorities. The same is true uh, in Europe, um, where uh, Roma children are more likely to be diagnosed with in intellectual disability. So there are context-specific countries. It's very difficult to, to, um, to be generalizing, because it depends on the context through which particular groups are being excluded and led to separate tracks. Um, the same happens with uh, immigrant or students of immigrant background in Western Europe. They're more likely to be uh, channeled to particular strands uh, that are slower and, and therefore exclude them from future education and further education opportunities. Again, that can go uh, at all levels. The, the, the report in the introduction has five groups from five uh, different regions of the world. So the Roma are ones, the Afro descendants in Latin America, the Rohingya in, in Asia, uh, the stateless in, in uh, uh, the Gulf states, um, uh, uh, another group, uh, the, um, uh, the, from, from Sub-Saharan Africa, the albinos. So in every context, you have groups that are really suffering, and there are many, many, many more groups that don't need to, but that's to say that that's why a, a region-specific approach is important in, uh, in discussing any of these uh, issues. But anyway, I think I've talked a lot, so I don't know if I have forgotten any of the, the questions that you, you answered, but thank you very much for the, for the responses to the, to the readings. Um, thank you, Manos. I think that you covered most of the comments and, and, and the questions. I think that this is time to come to the end of, um, of this session that has been really, really, really good. Thank you, Manos, for, for your time again, because as I said in the beginning, I know how busy you are, because every year or every year and something you have to produce uh, a very comprehensive report trying to cover these 
ambitious topics from an international perspective. And it's clear that you have captured very well in this report how context sensitive these uh, universal problems are. And we look forward also to the new report on non-state actors in education. Actually, you have one comment question from Jana on this topic, but maybe Jana, you will have to wait for this new report to, to come because okay. if we ask Manos to respond to your question on the role of non-state actors, probably we will have to finish at, at four. <laughs> So thank you again. I also have learned a lot from your comments and questions um, of the students. 